Well, good morning. First, I got to get rid of my gum. Uh, it's good to be here with you. Oh, is that right? <laughs> hmm. uh, it's nice to be invited to come and help you with your study through the book of Genesis. You're in chapter 16. No, I know, no, I know you're in Romans. I know you're in Romans. So uh, you might want to go ahead and turn to the book of Romans. And I know that you're, here you are reaching the end of the book of Romans, and you're going to have someone come in here and tell you um, that, uh, I, I don't know if uh, there's going to be some trouble, but Paul didn't actually write Romans. Uh, and uh, I think we'll, we'll see that. Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, we'll find out at the end. Uh, there was someone actually who wrote the book, um, but we'll get to that. We start off chapter 16, and uh, we read here, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Centria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of, for indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Right away, we are introduced to a dear sister of ours, uh, who I justifiably imagine was was just a delight to know uh, this woman this sister named phoebe there's no uh, there's no uh, uh reason why people name their children their daughters phoebe even today um, her name means radiant uh, or bright or shining one and i'll bet that's just what she was i'll bet that's just what she was um you know you you uh you see these names, and we're going to see quite a few of them, and just the joy of thinking of reading about them today and then one day meeting them, and there you are in heaven, and you're walking around shaking hands with people, and, you know, someday I'll be shaking hands. I don't know if it's going to happen this way, but uh, you're shaking hands with them, Scott, and they say, I'm Phoebe, and you're like, ah, oh, Phoebe, <laughs> we read about you, and to be able to, to meet her one day, and many of these, all of these who we're going to read about this morning brothers and sisters of ours. And that's neat what he speaks of her as our sister, Phoebe, our sister. And Paul writes, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister. I commend her to you, someone to take note of, someone in whom he would say, I have confidence, and you, you should have confidence in her too. She is worthy of that confidence. And it says that she was a servant of the church in Centria. Now, this word servant is rendered in some translations, maybe and some of you that have, some, some of you may have this in your Bible. Some translations will have it translated as deaconess, deaconess. But the Greek word doesn't have to mean what the word deaconess implies, as if she was appointed or recognized in some particular uh, fashion to some position in the church to be among the elders and the deacons. The word simply means servant. And it is used many times in the New Testament to simply say that, servant. Paul uh, even uses the word of himself, uh, but we don't consider him a deacon of an assembly of God's people. And yet he would use this very word servant of himself. When Paul writes Timothy, take a look at what he says. This will help us in this little point here. He says, likewise, deacons. That's our same word for servant. They must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let those also be first tested, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, look at that, their wives must be reverent, 
not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. And then let deacons be the husbands of one wife. So here as Paul writes to Timothy and speaks to him about this place of service, appointed, recognized individuals called deacons, gives us some help. It's just some evidence that when we're talking about Phoebe, the word would better be translated as servant and not deaconess. We see that these deacons, uh, they're spoken of and then their wives are spoken of. And so it's good, it's just a bit of good evidence as we go back to Romans. It's just a bit of evidence to help us understand that when those Bibles translate the word as servant, they probably are doing a better job using that word instead of deaconess. But I'm not going to go to the stake for it, but you guys can just, uh, it just seems to be very reasonable to think of it in that way. But it is a lovely thing to be. A servant is a lovely thing to be. And any Christian can be a servant, and every Christian ought to be. (laughs) And we may initially think of being a servant of God. When we think of being a servant, initially, we think a servant of God, which is quite right. That is what we are. We are servants of God. Um, and as soon as I, you know, I put these things together in my own notes, it, uh, there are certain things that come to mind very immediately. And uh, so I'll, this one, uh, this one, I remember when the three were thrown into the fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar calls them out. And when he calls them out, he says, "Servants of the Most High God, come out." Uh, and that's what they were. <laughs> what dignity, what honor that is to be able to be a servant of the Living God. Um, and then just seeing those three in the fiery furnace and looking at each other and being like, that's, yeah, that's what we are. <laughs> we are servants of the most high God. Hmm. But while that is true, do we see what it says here? It says that she's a servant of the church, a servant of the church and centria. So it's right for us to give thought of the honor and the dignity and the place that it is to consider ourselves as servants of God. But this specifically tells us that she was a servant of the church. And that's a good thing to be, too. There's great dignity and great honor in being a servant of the church. Serving among and for the sake of the brothers and sisters with whom we meet. To be a servant right here right here in this place. Phoebe, that's what she was. She was a servant of the church and the place where she gathered together with the saints. And every child of God should rise up to the dignity, to the responsibility of such a position as that. Yes, to be servant of the living God wherever we are, but to be a servant of the church among those with whom we gather. And that's what Phoebe was. And we're all equipped for something. We're all equipped for something. Each one of us, God has placed us in the body, and he has special responsibilities for us, a function to perform, that by means of our service to the house of God, to the saints, that there should be some benefit that they should receive by us being a servant to the saints among whom we gather. And I just tell you, we need you. (laughs) We need you. I mean, I'm traveling here. I'm only here. This is my one time this year. Next year, maybe I can come twice. Well, we're trying to plan that out. But um, it's a delight to come here and serve in some way. But, you know, for those of you, this is your place. These are your people. (laughs) This is where you come to worship and to meet and to fellowship and to be able to rise up to that place and, and, and serve here and the saints here, they need you. They need you, you know. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Or don't think otherwise. You have been given a gift. And it's for the service of the people of God primarily that the body might function well and grow up into all things, into Christ, and be healthy and strong. We need you. And so to see Phoebe as a servant of the church, I said, that's, I, want, I want to be among those named as serving the church as well. It says that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. You know, people come to us and uh, they're sent to us. We perhaps know 
them in one way or another, but uh, they're commended to us, and they come, and they are to be received in a certain way. They were, to, they were to absolutely welcome her right in, to just welcome her right in, to make her feel very at home as she came to them, to welcome her, to receive her in such a way as is right for saints, for saints to do recognizing that she herself is a saint. You know, you know, sometimes you may say, well, I'll treat this person this way, but that person, well, that person's a saint. I'm going to treat them a little bit better. But listen, uh, you know, we are saints, each one of us. Each one of us, we are saints. To recognize her in a manner worthy of saints, to recognize her as a saint, well, that calls for a certain kind of reception, a loving one, a kind, and generous one, um, to make her feel at home, and there are ways of doing things that accord with us being saints. There's just ways of doing things that accord with us being saints. And there are ways of doing things that accord with us recognizing that, hey, that sister, that brother, that young woman, that child is a saint. And there's behavior that accords with recognizing them as saints. And there's behavior that accords with me being a saint, to rise up to the dignity of what it means to be a saint and to behave like one so that no one ever says, well, I don't know about him. <laughs> no one on the, even on the outside would wonder whether we're a saint or not. Actually, I still uh, remember one time we, uh, we came to a rest area. This many years ago. We came to a rest area, and as we pulled into the, the spot, uh, we saw that there was a phone on the, on the on the parking spot. Um, so got out and picked it up, and we were able to contact the people. Uh, and they're like, oh, yes, that's our phone. We, we must have dropped it there. We were just there. We'll turn around and come back. So they did that, and we waited for them, and we saw them coming towards us. They, we kind of figured out who, who each other was. And as this uh, guy came towards me and I handed him the phone, he said, uh, oh, you guys are angels. And I said, well, we're not angels, but we are saints. <laughs> and, he's, and he said, oh, don't say that. <laughs> and his impression was, you know, in order to be a saint, you have to be dead. Well, I'm just here to tell you, no, that's not true. If you're living and you're a believer, you're a saint. <laughs> and to, to behave like one um, would be so very fitting to see that others, brothers and sisters, are saints. I wonder how much better we would behave towards one another if we did both, if we acted like saints and we treated one another like saints. But they were to receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of saints. And then it says then to assist her, to assist her in whatever business she has need of. Basically saying, help her. Help her. <clears throat> For indeed, she has been a helper. She herself has been a helper. You help her. She has been a helper. You help her. You be a helper to this helper. And she's been a helper, it says, of many, and myself, of myself also. What a dear sister, a dear sister Phoebe. And she was coming to them, and she was to be understood and known to be a helper. And not just a helper, but a helper of many, and even of the Apostle Paul himself. And they were to help her. We should help others. <laughs> we should help. I mean, every time we have an opportunity, we should look to be helping others, but perhaps especially those who themselves are helpers, especially those. Let's not miss an opportunity. If there are those who are serving the Lord and they are helpers of others, let's help them, help them in their work. <clears throat> well, the next two names might sound familiar to us. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. Hmm. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. Hmm. A most interesting couple, these two, and we have to take a minute to look into them. They're probably our most, maybe, well, Timothy's mentioned later too, but they might, they're just some of the most famous people that we're going to look at this morning, and they're mentioned in various places in the scripture. Let's take a look at that. Here in the book of Acts, chapter 18, we read, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, 
who had recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. Now that's a little interesting detail. That Claudius had commanded that there would be no Jews in Rome. Hmm. No Jews in Rome, you have to get out. Well, they had left for that reason, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. Hmm. So here Paul meets them, and he works alongside of them, making tents together with them. And so this friendship begins. And here he is in this letter to the Romans speaking about them. But this goes back to the time when they first met, when they first met. The next passage underneath there says, Then Paul took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. So he went from uh, not knowing them to knowing them and then to having them travel with him. And then he was writing about them to others, sending them. So what a relationship, what a development in this relationship with these two. There's another passage in the book of Acts that tells us a little bit about this couple. It says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when, there's our couple, Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. I mean, what a remarkable couple. They were able to take this brilliant man, Apollos, who knew so very much and was so eloquent and working so powerfully, and they were able to come alongside of him and help him understand things a bit more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. So when Apollos was going someplace, they wrote a letter about him and said, hey, when he comes, you make sure to receive him. You make sure to receive him. And they did. And it's great what happened with Apollos when he arrived. It says that uh, when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. There's some sermons and preaching you wish it could have been there for <laughs> and uh, just would have been exciting to hear Apollos uh, just refuting publicly and showing that Jesus from the scriptures that Jesus indeed is the Christ and look what Paul calls them here in Romans I go back to Romans he says my fellow workers in Christ Jesus Priscilla and Aquila my fellow workers in Christ Jesus so not just working together, making tents. I mean, that, was, that must have been enjoyable to be able to serve together like that, to make a living. Not just travel companions from time to time, and not even just those who knew the scriptures together, but labor together. They work together in Christ Jesus. What a precious relationship Paul had with these two. And it's no wonder that he would just speak of them so highly and want to send a greeting to them. Hmm. You know, we all do one manner of work or another, but as Christians, there definitely needs to come a point in time where we begin, even increasingly, become servants in Christ Jesus. That's what Priscilla and Aquila were, fellow workers laboring in Christ Jesus that our work, that our life's work even, becomes more and more spiritual in its quality, laboring in Christ Jesus. And look what Paul says next. He says, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches among the Gentiles. They risked their own necks. Their life was laid on the line for the Apostle Paul, and he speaks about it, and you just wonder what that was all about. There's a lot of stories in the world today, a lot of stories to be told. Christians willing to give up their life so that they can serve the Lord Jesus and be fellow workers with others. 
You know, you consider uh, this couple, all that we've thought about them even so far, and you look at your own life, and perhaps it's not too out of place to say, man, I got to step it up a bit. (laughs) I got to step it up a bit as I'm considering this couple here. Some of my brothers and sisters are risking their lives for the sake of their brethren and their service to the Lord. Some of my brothers and sisters are so spent for others that everyone seems to give thanks for them. Maybe I, maybe I need to step, step it up a little bit. This couple, remarkable. But there's even more, actually. It says, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. We're already thinking so highly of these two, and now we find that there was an assembly of God's people that they brought into their home, and that's where they met, right in their house. (laughs) You know, there's some important lessons to learn in that statement there, the church that is in their house, particularly that we keep in mind, and I think we all know this, the church is not the building, right? The church is the people. So we didn't say a building was in their house. (laughs) We say the people, the church, met in their home. And that the building, the church meets in something as simple as a home. And that it is quite likely that the church might therefore be small in number too. I don't know how big their home was, but Probably not as big as we are this morning, I imagine. So the church was meeting, and maybe it just wasn't all that big. But it was the church, and they were in their home meeting. Hmm. Things sure have gotten complex since those early days. And in some ways, we can see the value of going beyond the quaintness and simplicity and intimacy of gathering together in a house of a saint. I mean, it's just wonderful. I wish my home assembly had a gym of some sort, you know. I wish we had a parking lot. (laughs) I mean, you know, so we can see that there's some advantage to moving in that direction. Um, But in other ways, we can see that far too much has been added and ornateness has been pursued and great cost spent in creating such things as cathedrals for the church to meet in so much to please the eye right so much i gotta admit to you i was in ireland and i don't even remember what the building was but it was magnificent i remember sitting in there and there was choir singing and i was feeling pretty religious (laughs) but you know that's not that's not how that's not true religion but boy does it like cater to the sense and the feeling that i am being religious and that i'm in the presence of god and i imagine that some of the some of those who labored to build those places, that their heart was in a good place. They wanted to honor God, and they felt with a sincere heart that he deserved such things as this. <clears throat> we were in, uh, went to Trinity Church in Manhattan, visited there. Just magnificent, magnificent structure, architecture, design, details, and you just are, it, it's, it's beautiful. But as we think about such things, we want to remember that Aquila and Priscilla had a church that met in their house, in their house. I remember when COVID first started, we had our breaking of bread, you know, uh, at the Abrahams, because that was the weekend that we didn't meet here. That was the very weekend that I came up, and we said, well, I guess we're not going to meet this weekend. And uh, so we, in the house, there we were. And that is not something strange. It's been going on for a long time, even since this very first century, and it still happens. We had a a missionary that was talking to us uh, from Pakistan. Boy, things are different in other parts of the world. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, and I don't think I'm telling you something most of you probably don't already know, but there are still saints gathering together in something as simple as someone's home. You know what, brothers and sisters? We might be getting back to that. You know, as persecution arises more and more, we might not be able to meet in such large numbers as this. We might not be able to meet in such a public way as this if we're interested at all in safety. That's the way it is in many parts of the world right now. 
If it ever happens, just remember, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay that we are meeting in a home. <clears throat> and so it was even with Priscilla and Aquila. <clears throat> wow, that's a lot of text. Uh, that's, uh, that's our next section in Romans. Uh, I put it all on one screen there. Um, <laughs> But I put this all on one slide to show a couple of things, okay? Watch this. Because it's fun to just see this. It's maybe hard to see it as you look in your Bible, but as you see this large text of names, I want you to notice a couple things. <coughs> greet, 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 <laughs> greet. You know, I, certainly he could have said, greet everybody. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, might have been an easier thing, or save some ink. <laughs> but here, anyway, it looks like he wanted to greet the saints by name. And so he does. So many of them. He could have just said, say hi to everyone for me. <laughs> he just went through, and he named, he named names. Speaking of names, watch that. Look at this. Whew. There's a lot of names there. Not many of them, you don't meet people with names like this today. <laughs> Never met an Ephanetist. I'm not even sure if that's how you would pronounce it. He'd probably be offended if it <laughs> But maybe Mary we see there, uh, that's, uh, that's a, a name that we certainly run into today. Um, and Julia is down there on the lower left-hand corner. I think that's about it. If you're scouring for names that you might run into today, that might be about it. But there are some other ones to just mention here that are kind of fun. Um, uh, I was uh, talking to, uh, and I was going to talk about these things in one place not that long ago, and I, and I was giving Paul Brampson a ride to the airport. Uh, Michelle and I uh, took him to the airport from the CMML conference. We were talking about these things, and he said, there's one name on there I really like. And uh, since, since he told me that, I like it too now. <laughs> and it's the name all the way in the lower left-hand corner, Philologus. So Logos is the word, Logos, right, Logo. Uh, the word in Philo is love. So this man is called the lover of the word. So that's a, that's a great name. You know, that's a great name. Uh, you got a son on the way, maybe Philo Logos. There you go. <laughs> it would be great to be characterized by such a name as that, one who loves the word. And then, now this is a little uh, speculation, but that, that name Rufus, greet Rufus, that's on the uh, lower left-hand corner too. Uh, greet Rufus. Now, what makes that name interesting is that, do you remember uh, Mark tells us this in his gospel, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, you remember what he did? He carried the cross. He carried the cross. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, how many Rufuses were there back in that day? I don't know if that was a common name or not. But here we have Rufus, and maybe it was his very father that carried uh, the cross for our Savior. Listen to what the Apostle John writes at the end of his third letter. He says, I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. That's why John's, like, you know, John's letters are not very long. He's got some really short ones. If you're ever doing sword drill, uh, you can always fool somebody. Well, the potential is always there to fool somebody by telling them that uh, the verse they're trying to find is, uh, first or second John chapter two and, you know, to throw that in there with first hesitations or something like that or the book of Hezekiah and uh, they'll be thoroughly frustrated with you but John was writing very quickly because his heart was I just want to be with you and I want when I get there I'll talk to you about the things I want to talk to you about so this letter is going to be really short <laughs> but in this short letter uh, he says peace to you and he says our friends greet you and then he says this greet the friends by name greet the friends by name this is a challenge isn't it right <laughs> this is a challenge especially here now please be kind to myself and michelle you know coming here once a year twice a year you know to try and remember names so um, but we 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 try <laughs> and we will we'll continue to do better as we continue to come but Certainly you all should know each other's names. You, you're here meeting with each other regularly. And when 
you see each other, John says, greet each other by name. That, believe me, that can be, uh, that can be tense. That can be really tense, I'm telling you. Uh, sometimes when we're um, in homes and we pray, uh, and if I pray for, you know, the family, and I'm going through the names, it's one of my terrifying fears that I'm going to forget someone's name <laughs> or, or, or that I'm going to uh, just uh, miss, uh, I'm going to miss one or something like that. It takes uh, some bravery. Can I say that? It takes some bravery to put yourself out there and really try to fulfill what John is saying here, to greet one another by names. And I'll tell you one thing that's helped me very practically. All of these names, Paul, he knows them. He knows them by name. And I can tell you one of the things that Paul's doing with all of those names that he listed, that he could speak of them and think of them very clearly, who is who. One of the things that I, I know that helped him to do that is he was praying for them. Now listen, brothers and sisters, you start praying for someone, and I guarantee you that in time, their name will stick, okay? Their name will stick. There's other things that will help their name stick too, but you pray for people, and you pray for them by name. In this day and age, it's really nice. You got something like Facebook, and you can go on, like, who is that person again? And you're like, you can see their face, and it helps identify. But to make effort and to pray for people, as their names come up, it'll be much easier to remember their names when you see them. Well, going back to Romans here, I want you to notice another word that Paul likes to use about his brothers and sisters. Now watch this. It's not going to appear as many times as this, but it's a wonderful word. Beloved. Beloved. Um, he just loved people, you know. <laughs> he loved his brothers and sisters, and he would speak of them now and again as beloved. Um, it certainly is the heart that every believer should have for their brothers and sisters to think of them as those who are beloved. Now, we're going to shift gears a little bit here. Paul goes on to say, now I urge you. Now, you know, when, when Paul, anyone, but when Paul is going to say something, he says, oh, you can almost just sense that it's coming from really deep within him to just, I, I, I have something I have to say, and I'm pleading with you to listen to me. I am urging you, please listen to what I'm about to say. I urge you, brethren, note those, pay attention to those who cause divisions. I'm urging you, please pay attention to people who are causing divisions. This word divisions, it means those who drive wedges between brethren. It's one of the things the Lord hates, right? He hates those who sow, sow discord among the brethren. These who cause divisions, that's what they do. They drive wedges between brethren. They separate friends. And Paul says, I'm urging you, please pay attention to them. Not only those who do that, but also who cause offenses. This word means those who facilitate occasions whereby others stumble. How do you like that? My goodness, that there would be individuals and they are looking for ways in which they can cause others to stumble, particularly into sin. Or they're so careless about themselves that they just, um, they just inadvertently, maybe not so purposely, but just out of carelessness, are causing others to stumble even into sin. And this is all contrary to the doctrine that you have learned. It's contrary. You've learned things. You've understood things. We were talking on Saturday about wholesome words, receiving just wholesome words that are meant to, to build us up, to edify us, and make us nice and strong and healthy. There's teaching that accords with godliness, and we're learning these things. Well, these that cause divisions and offenses, they're acting in, in contradiction to the very things that we have learned. And this is so interesting, right? It says, and avoid them. It's very sad to have to say that there are Times when there are those even among us that we need to avoid. They're troublemakers. And sometimes even wicked ones. And we have to keep our eye out for them. You'll remember these next words from Paul to the elders at Ephesus. 
I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves, to all the flock. This is like, pay attention. Please note, please pay attention. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So we've got people on the outside that are coming in. But then look at this. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch. And remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. It's the urging, the the aching of the heart of the Apostle Paul that there should even be those in the midst of the saints that are troublemakers and causing divisions and looking to even lead people away to themselves and separate brethren. He spoke one time about this guy, Alexander the coppersmith. He said, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You must also beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. And I'm not saying Alexander the coppersmith was among the saints, but just the simple fact that there are people and they need to be avoided. They've greatly resisted this one and those like him, greatly resisted the words of the apostle, the word of God. Another passage this one to Timothy. In the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Similarly, John speaks, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves. Look to yourselves that we do not lose the things we have worked for. Oh, how much labor has gone on by the servants of God for the people of God, that they should grow up and be healthy and strong and to be able to stand. And then there's this danger that comes in, and there's a need for exhortation to just watch, to be careful, to look to yourselves that we do not lose the things that we have worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who does not abide in the doctrine of Christ has, uh, or he who does abide in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, which as we saw earlier, could be where the church is meeting. Nor greet him, for he who greets him and share, uh, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Now, maybe there's some a different opinion of this, but I, and I, you know, we can talk about this, but when Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door, I do not talk to them. I do not greet them. I do not receive them into my house. Now, if I'm sitting next to one on an airplane, or if I meet someone in a market or something like that, oh, you know, I w- I'll want to speak up for the Lord as he gives me the opportunity to and the boldness. I will want to be an influence. But when they come to me, when they come to me bringing some other doctrine, um, it's very striking for them to, to hear that, um, to be greeted in such a way as that, and maybe that's the impression the Lord wants to give to them. Yeah. I may tell them that I'm praying against them as they go around spreading a false gospel, but uh, maybe just that is what's appropriate in ways that we don't even understand. And again, it's just sad to have to acknowledge and even to have to keep our eyes attentive to such individuals who we may account, encounter or who may come to us or from time to time 
who may be am among us. It's just, it got to be sober, you know, sober and intelligent. Okay, he says next, for those who are such, do not serve our Lord Christ. What a contrast to what we have been considering about these others of serving the Lord, serving in Christ Jesus, serving the saints. These, they don't serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Just whatever fleshly desires they have, whatever natural desires they have, they just want to fulfill those things, even a physical appetite as well. Just feed me. And by smooth words, by smooth words, and flattering speech, I mean, this is not easy to detect. This is why there has to be a carefulness and a soberness and an attentiveness to it because they're very slick in the way that they are approaching things. And they have this, this wording that's very smooth like oil or like butter. Like the war is in his heart. And flattering speech, you know, make, make you feel good about yourself as you're talking to them, but something is amiss. They are looking to do what? To deceive. No, this is, like, I don't, I like giving cheerful messages, but, like, you, you can't avoid passages like this that are dealing with difficult circumstances that are real life, that there are people that we are going to encounter, and there's got to be a guardedness. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. And this is one of the saddest things they deceive the hearts of the simple. They deceive the hearts of the simple. You know, when we hear that something's done to a little one, oh, we saw that, that movie, Sound of Freedom, sex trafficking. And when you, you know, when you give any thought to that, there's this rage, right, that just, that some, someone innocent and young just doesn't, no, that someone has deceived them, has tricked them, and has done harm to them. Well, there's the same reality in the spiritual realm. And Paul, oh, he would just, he would say, who is, not, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? That these little ones, these ones that are just growing up in the faith, just learning about the Lord Jesus Christ, just becoming strong, but that someone should come along and because of their smooth words and their flattering speech, they trick them and do them harm. And those of us who are older, like, we need to watch out for them until they can watch out for themselves. And brothers and sisters, it's okay to be simple for a while. And I don't, you know, we're talking about the spiritual realm. Some people are older physically, but they're very young spiritually. They're very young spiritually. And even though they're old and wise about many things in the world, they're very young spiritually, and they're very susceptible to be tricked and deceived. And brothers and sisters, it's okay to be simple for a while. We can't stay there, though. We have to become wise. We have to become mature. We have to become strong. To be simple, to be innocent, well, in that sense, there's a time and a place for it, but we must grow up. There's danger around. I know I'm, give me a couple more minutes and I can finish up. It says, Peter says, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, uh, particularly that people will twist the scriptures, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness. Being led away with the error of the wicked it doesn't mean you are wicked, but you're led away with the error of the wicked. If you're not careful, you're led away with the error of the wicked. Led, certainly by means of deception. But instead, grow. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There you go. This is what we want to do. We want to grow up. We want to grow up. And if any father looks at their children and sees that they aren't growing, it breaks his heart. You know, our Heavenly Father looks at his children and he says, how I desire for them to grow up, be strong, and know the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> As we finish up with these last few verses, it says, 
for your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, and I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Sometimes it seems like the Christian can be the opposite of that. Sometimes Christians seem to be so knowledgeable on things of this world that are just anti-God and anti-Christ and they're evil and there's just such a familiarity with them and not so much a familiarity with what is good and we've got to transition out of that and I'm speaking from my own life because it was definitely lopsided in my life way knew way too much about those things which were evil need to be simple concerning things that are evil but wise in regard to those things that are good and we learn these things. It takes time for these things, but we must move forward. Speaking of what I know, I'm like over time. Can I just, this is my only time here all year. Can I just like finish up here? <laughs> you see we're on verse 20. I'm not even finishing the chapter. So, and this says, and the God of peace. Oh, what a lovely thing that our God is. He is the God of peace. <laughs> he's the God of a lot of things. And one of the things that he is, is he's the God of peace. I just want to show you this list real quick of things that he is the God of. The God of mercies, the God of love, the God of glory, the God of grace, the God of Israel, the God of the living, the God of earth, the God of heaven. But more frequently than anything, he is called the God of peace. That should, res- that, that, that should mean something to us. Our God is the God of peace. Um, and we are to be peacemakers ourselves, right? Mm. And look what he says next. He will crush Satan. I mean, just, that's, see, I can't, I can't end the sermon before I get to that. <laughs> I mean, this is just, what a way to just keep on writing. And we've got a lot of things to be careful of. We've got a lot of things to be aware of. We've got to grow up and be mature and just, just keep note of things because there's deceivers, there's people going to do harm. But hey, let me tell you this. The day is coming <laughs> when the God of peace is going to crush Satan. He's going to crush Satan. So if you didn't remember anything from this message and you leave here today, what did the preacher talk about? He said, he talked about how one day God's going to crush Satan. That would be good. Just leave with that. <laughs> we could. What a hope uh, that is as we believe it. The day is coming when this God of peace is going to crush Satan. And look what he's going to crush Satan under. Your feet shortly. And if we had time, I'd tell you this story about this guy Abimelech and how he wanted so badly not to be remembered as having been killed by a woman, and it didn't work. <laughs> but some of you know the story I'm talking about. But here, the great Satan is going to be crushed under the feet of a woman, the church. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Last verses. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason and Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, that's what I was talking about. Paul didn't write this. <laughs> Paul didn't write Romans. It's a good trivia question. You can just mess with people. I, Tertius, wrote this epistle. Paul didn't write it with his own hand, but he is the author of it. He's the one who dictated to this man, Tertius, to write these things down. And he himself greeted the saints there in Rome in the Lord. Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church greets you. Seems like this guy, Gaius, had a, had a church in his home. He was the host of the whole church. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you, and Cortus, a brother. Hmm. And I'll just finish with uh, this guy, Erastus. My last thing I can bring up here is uh, he's an interesting character here. He's the treasurer of the city. Erastus, the treasurer of the city. And it just brings to mind that probably most of us here, as we think about being servants of the Lord, being servants of the church, um, that many of us have jobs, responsibilities, and this man, he was a treasurer of the city. He had things he had to do. He had to go to work on Monday morning, you know, and yet uh, there he was among the saints with his own responsibilities to serve the Lord and help others, to be a servant of the church and Most of us here probably have responsibilities that take up a lot of the portion of our life, but that should not keep us from some of the things that we've been thinking about this morning, to be fellow workers in Christ Jesus, behaving like saints and treating our brothers and sisters as saints, even greeting one another by name and becoming more familiar with one another's names on account of praying for one another, and even perhaps as the day may come when we may have opportunity to risk our necks for one another. You know, and all this even at the same time while being a treasurer 
of the city. <laughs> do our jobs to do them in, as unto the Lord. We were thinking about that on Saturday morning. But don't forget to serve the Lord, right? And to be about the spiritual work. Um, and then soon enough, the God of peace will crush Satan under our feet shortly. It's going to be a good day. <laughs> it's going to be a good day. So uh, we can look forward to that. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, our Lord and Savior, I, first off, the first thing that comes to mind is just thank you for the saints here letting me have a few extra minutes. I usually don't go over this much, but <laughs> just thank you for their patience and attentiveness. And we do pray that your word would just resonate with us and uh, those things that are meant to stick with each of us individually, that uh, they would linger for a while and that you'd be able to have the influence on us that really we should desire you to have on us. And that ultimately, we would be those uh, that uh, Paul could write about. Uh, we would be those who are serving you. And uh, we are those uh, here in this very assembly of your people where we are a benefit and a blessing to our brothers and sisters, behaving like saints and treating others like saints and uh, just having a good time while we wait for that glorious day, uh, Lord Jesus, when you come for us and when Satan is finally put down completely. So we just ask all these things, giving thanks, Lord, in your name. Amen.